When I was much younger, I imagined a world that spanned a colony of concrete skyscrapers, the sky flooded with flying shards and splinters of steel, life slowly dissipating, and the sun nowhere to be seen. In simpler words, I imagined a much scarier place. This is a fault that cannot be attributed to my once naive mind, being born in a generation immensely saturated by constant change in technicolor images of the Jetsons and Futurama aired in prime time, coincidentally at the height of the Back to the Future franchise that depicted a highly industrial and futuristic 2015. Because of this, it is not too far-fetched to speculate that science fiction is no longer an articulation of man's wildest imagination, but individual predictions of what lies ahead. But to belong in a generation propelled by mass media and pop culture, it is expected of us to wear these predictions, not only because it is the most desirable, but also most possible, channeling no less than our history as prime basis, man pledging the world's indispensable minerals and other resources in an eternal vacuum, spoiling wonders and turning them into hot asphalts for mere parking spaces, as if everything in this planet is at our command and disposal, all in an infinite attempt to systematically convert every aspect of science fiction into fact. This mindset, to me, is a social disease that needs to be eradicated, and I do not wish to live in that world. Not a chance, no, if we only tried our best to save the world. And as much as it is unthinkable for us to configure our future families in that universe, it is even more unforgivable to do nothing to change that. Desmond Tutu once said, To be neutral in a situation of injustice is to have chosen sides already. It is to support the status quo. The disposition of our natural environment, as well as its inhabitants, can so easily be likened to injustice. We see this when corporate bureaucrats extract precious minerals from vast parcels of earth, rendering so many communities vulnerable to, to calamities that harm people in critical mass, all under the veil of providing transitory employment opportunities that show absolutely no statistical evidence of significant, visible, or tangible improvement in the quality of living. That is injustice. But in a seemingly hopeless world, it wouldn't be too instructive to go beneath the surface of what can be done and what must be done. Sustainable development entails satisfying the needs of today without compromising the needs of the future. This means providing as much job opportunities, eradicating world hunger by securing food and other commodities, maximizing space, dispersing the population, and trimming down poverty to the bare minimum. But beyond that, sustainable development entails not only the preservation of life, but also the improvement in the quality of life. It must be understood that in order for us to foster sustainable development for our exponentially growing population of 7 billion people with the vast majority living below the poverty line, concrete institutional reform through a collaborative effort coming from all sectors of society is imperative. This combat against an interconnected web of problems requires variance and diversity in the, in the methods by which we apply. This means solutions must both be punitive and rehabilitative in nature and must be institutionalized by major stakeholders down to the grassroots level. We pursue this in two folds. Punitive, by instituting deterrent reforms to combat man's perpetual acts of belligerence and rehabilitative to condition societal mentality towards a greener and a more livable community through moderate mechanisms. Through this, our solutions become interconnected as well, such as by advocating green and ethical consumerism. We don't only promote personal and cultural well-being, but by doing so, we embolden small medium enterprises or SMEs and multinational corporations to alter and improve their production and services tailor fit for the environmentally conscious and ethical consumer groups alike, thus promoting a much cleaner and a much safer area for corporate groups to explore as well. We look retrospectively back to how radicals and moderates were able to come together in their collective pursuits through the initiatives of the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or PETA, in their advocacy to boycott and disestablish some of the world's most influential and most powerful fashion czars for their inhumane use of animal fur. And if there is anything we can learn from their success, it is that we too 
can all come together for a larger cause to make the future we want become possible. This cause, however, is more elaborate than it seems. This cause proposes a complete and total transformation of our social constructs. Allow me to revert back to the features of the past world, a time when progressive urban, urban development was institutionalized because of our perpetual need to change for the good. The difference between then and now is that today, urban development exists not only in the hopes of improving, but because of the damaging effects of man's choices to our Mother Earth and in the process to ourselves have forced us to a situation of self-preservation. It is no longer a matter of development for the sake of developing, but a matter of development for the sake of survival. To put it simpler, the future I want does not feature short-term convenience by exhibiting various modes of transportation or whatnot. The future I want is as simple as knowing that the people living on the other ends of the world are not dying from starvation over what could have e so easily been avoided such as calamities that pose irrevocable harm. Each year, we produce an enormous amount of graduates that rummage for new jobs but cannot all be absorbed by our pool of employment. It is not that status quo can present an ample number of job opportunities. It is simply that the disproportion of our jobs and talents, each with a specific expertise, is vast. We have overcrowded fields that require less people while the ones that demand more people are underpopulated and scarce. To change this requires as much individual reform as institutional reform. We achieve that change when governments capitalize on its natural resources through agriculture and ecotourism as prime areas that should be made more available and should be given more access to the people, while on the far opposite end of the spectrum, change requires an educated population that does not only possess the necessary skills but as well as a genuine will to explore these fields of expertise. In doing so, we strike a balance between protecting the people and the natural environment. This is where we understand that the solution to these problems is collective and interconnected in nature. By achieving the first goal that aims to provide more jobs, in the process it resolves several other major problems that the world seeks to eradicate. With more people working together and contributing to the collective betterment of our world, we do not only reduce poverty levels, but we also promote food security for the people. We begin to maximize our space and trim down scarcity of resources in areas with severe concentration of people by dispersing the population when and only when these jobs are dispersed as well. And that would have already made a difference. These problems each have solutions that seek to achieve different things. But you must understand that in spite of the variance of these solutions, in as much as our personal differences have set us apart, we may altogether echo a better future for our posterity. We rest at the pinnacle of time when the world needs us the most, as we too need it. And in this generation saturated by constant change, let us be reminded that change is not one-dimensional and that the convenient path is not the only path we may take towards the twilight of tomorrow. The future world I want seeks a generation that makes better choices. But more than that, a generation that is given the chance to live, to play, and to experience the wonders of the natural world. For in my highest of hopes, they will look back at our generation with pride. And to me, that will always be more important than concrete skyscrapers and flying aircrafts. If we only tried our best to save the world. Thank you.